Hi there, everyone. This is uh, Kevin from uh, PCI Geomatics. We're just about to get ready to start the webinar. We're exactly 8 o'clock a.m. here in Ottawa, Canada. We're really pleased that you could join us. And uh, we'll be coming back in just about one minute. Thanks. Perfect. All right. Well, welcome everyone to our webinar entitled Automated, Automated Object-Based Image Classification Using Geomatica. We are pleased you could join us today. So uh, today we, I am joined by Jason Flatt, who is our Technical Solutions Specialist. Um, and I'm on the left, Kevin Jones, uh, Director of Marketing here at PCI, so happy you could join us. Just some simple things to go through. Basically, uh, all of the lines are muted during the presentation, so um, if you're in a room with other people, you can make noise. You're not going to disrupt the presentation. That's fine. We really encourage you to type questions in the questions panel throughout the session. Don't wait until the end. Um, if you have any issues with your audio or anything like that, um, you can raise your hand, or if you're having a problem hearing us, uh, chances are you might want to check your volume on your computer before you contact us. It might just be as simple as that. Uh, but if there's another problem, then uh, we have some uh, people on the line. We've got Mauro, who's, uh, who's our uh, marketing specialist, who's on the line, who's going to uh, be there to help answer questions if you have any issues. So um, this is part of a webinar series, which... Uh, uh, we uh, started last fall with the release of our latest uh, version of our software, Geomatica Banff. Um, and uh, we're repeating the, the series uh, early in the year, so starting uh, today, January 28th. And uh, we've changed the content a little bit. So if you did attend the previous uh, webinars, we encourage you to uh, stick around because we have some new content to show you. Uh, we did improve it a little bit and change it a little bit. So, um, so each webinar is going to be a little bit different. But uh, this one's topic is object-based image analysis and, and using automation. Uh, we have another webinar coming up on UAV processing and information extraction. And then we have another webinar on Sentinel-1 tops. So we're going to be providing you with a lot of really good content over the coming weeks. So be sure to register for all of those sessions coming up. Just a quick outline of what we're planning to present today. So we've gone through the introduction. We um, we're going to review what kind of data was used in, in this case, and uh, we're going to give you some highlights from the latest release. 
And then we're going to get into batch classification workflow description. And then Jason's going to give a live demonstration and talk to you about some of the results that we were able to achieve using high resolution aerial data uh, to extract building footprints. So really quickly about our company. So this is uh, basically what we're all about. So we create and deliver geoimage software products platforms and solutions for customers around the world. So uh, we make Geomatica, we make GXL, and we also use that technology to, to deliver custom solutions for our customers around the world. So that's just, if you're new to PCI, that's really what we're about. We're a software company. We make products, platforms, and solutions. These are some of the platform elements. And really what this is meant to show you is the uh, ability to scale uh, with with PCI technology. So we have a, a traditional desktop image processing software package known as Geomatica, which is typically used for doing image analysis, image exploration. However, it can be used to automate uh, production. We have uh, GXL on the right, which is our geoimaging accelerator, which is more of a high volume production system. And it leverages the core technology that's uh, that that's in Geomatica. So we have a, a number of algorithms. We have over 580 algorithms last time I counted. And uh, all of those algorithms can be automated within the Geomatica environment or within the GXL environment, mainly leveraging Python. But in the case of GXL, it's also leveraging multi-node processing and high volume production using multiple compute systems. Um, so our platform is quite broad. It's quite flexible and scalable. So Geomatica Banff, just to give you a quick little summary on this latest release. So the release uh, came out on November 26, 2019, so uh, about uh, two months ago. And um, today, what we're going to be talking about is leveraging some of the functionality in that web in that uh, release for automating the uh, feature extraction from imagery. So that was a key function that was added to that release. And uh, that's what we'll be focusing on today. But before we get into the content, we want to engage the audience and get some feedback. So we've got a quick little poll here. It's just going to take a few minutes. Um, so we're interested to know um, how are you currently extracting features from imagery? So we're, we're wondering if uh, you're using other software. It could be commercial software. Maybe you're developing uh, open so maybe you're developing a solution using open source, maybe you're using PCI technology already. Um, and if you're using something else, we'd love to hear what it is. We uh, strive to be very much in tune with what uh, our customers are, are looking for. Um, and uh, our developers and our product management team is constantly uh, listening to feedback from the market to improve the product as we release. Uh, I didn't get into it, but we do release the software on a very regular basis. About every five months, we average a uh, either a major release or a, or a, a feature-rich uh, service pack. So thank you for that. I'm going to close it down in uh, just a few more seconds, give a few, uh, just a people a chance to vote. So I'm going to close down in three, two, one. Thank you very much. And I'll just quickly share that. Um, so it looks like uh, uh, quite a lot of people using commercial software uh, and then PCI and then kind of a mix between open source and, and other. So, And if you did say other, then we'd love to hear what that is. Just type it in the questions panel. And I can see that some of you did that, so thank you very much for doing that. Okay, so getting into it. So let's review the actual data source. Sorry, I'm just skipping ahead here. Let's review the data source that's being used in this particular webinar. Just waiting for the screen to update here. Okay, there's a bit of a delay on the on the on the webinar, so I'm just going to wait for the slides to catch up. So Perfect. Okay, so review data source. So we're using ADS, which is a push broom airborne sensor um, that was actually used quite a bit here in Canada, specifically in Ontario, to collect large areas, actually 
most of the province of Ontario has been completely imaged using the sensor. So it's quite a quite a interesting sensor, and we've been using it quite a bit for some of our clients. Um, what's what makes this data unique is that um, it's high resolution number one, uh, but it also contains uh, a couple of key pieces of information. So it's got four bands of data. These are this is a true color composite, so showing the red, green, blue bands. But there's also an infrared band, and you can see the color infrared or the false color composite uh, being represented here, and that's going to be useful to derive indices. Um, to help separate some of the classes as we're doing our analysis. The other thing that's really unique is that this data is flown in stereo. So there's simultaneous forward, backward, and nadir collections occurring. And in the case of this data, we were able to uh, order stereo strips. So they're quite long. They're typically about 80 or uh, 70, 70 to 85 sort of kilometers long. They're only about three and a half kilometers wide, but they're flown in stereo. And when we order this data from the government of Ontario, we can actually get two of the stereo looks. So normally I believe we get the forward and the nadir. Um, and this is just kind of showing you what that, look like, what that looks like for ADS. Um, so we actually get the, um, the forward and the nadir images uh, perfectly overlapping. So you can see on the right, that that basically gives us the opportunity to leverage the parallax and the data to process the elevation model. Um, and, and what's really beneficial about the way the data is flown is we get a, uh, a, a as less uh, artifacts along the edges of the images because the, the nadir portion of the data is uh, usually looking straight down at the buildings at all times, so whereas a digital frame system has uh, inherently some building lean because there's a delay between the collections, whereas this is a continuous imaging uh, mode. So we can get really nice data sets that have uh, a, a small amount of, of lean in the images. So I just want to highlight a few things about the latest release as it relates to object analyst. So one of the uh, key things First and foremost, in terms of the design of the system, we made it so that it was powerful, yet easy to use. So um, we think that it, we've achieved that objective. We think it's it's based on all the segmentation, the classification. Um, we've uh, we've hired some of the best people uh, to develop the software. People who've done advanced degrees in object-based image analysis and uh, you know, we've made smart choices about how to implement the segmentation algorithms, how to implement the classification and so on. And we've integrated all of that inside the Geomatica system so that you can leverage all of the rich functionality that exists inside Geomatica. So it doesn't just do object-based, it does obviously image processing within Geomatica plus the object-based. And you can see here one of the specific algorithms um, that we've developed, which is uh, based on iterative hierarchical clustering for the segmentation. Some of the key things as it relates to this release, the BAMF release. So we've added batch processing. So there's the ability to automatically process data sets using uh, the GUI inside Focus. And there's also the, uh, the majority of the functions, pretty much the whole workflow is available within Python as well. So it's your choice. You can either work within Focus or you can write Python scripts and uh, you, you use the functionality that way. Um, we have a series of new attributes as it relates to texture, geometry, and spectral indices. I'm going to go through that in a second. And really, this batch processing is what we think is, um, is, is something to really take advantage of now. Uh, you can streamline and create repeatable classification applications, and that's what, what Jason is going to be showing you. He's going to be showing you how we use that ADS imagery to determine a uh, methodology to establish a model that can then be replicated across other areas within the same strip and going even further for other strips within that same data type we could actually automate the whole processing and extract all of the buildings across very very large data sets 
Um, these are some of the uh, highlights as relates to vegetation indices. So we've added this capability within our software. We've always had good metadata handling. So if an image is ingested into our system, we will uh, have specific metadata tags that uh, tell the software which band is which, so which, which is blue, green, red, near infrared. And based on that, as you can see in the menu, we have the ability to uh, calculate different vegetation indices automatically. So it will know that if you want to calculate an NDVI, it knows that the red channels, the 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 red uh, multispectral channel is in is in uh, raster channel number three, and the near infrared is in raster channel number four, and it needs that to do the band math to calculate the NDVI. Um, another example is the texture window. So we've added this right click and the option to uh, specify the size of the kernel or the size of the window that you're going to be using. Um, and there's there's some new measurements that are available. So you can see them behind there, mean, um, entropy, angular, sec, I can't quite see, I can't quite read, but there's, there's five different texture measures that are available there. Uh, geometric indices, we've added five new geometric indices. I believe they're at the bottom there. So convexity, solidity, form factor, major axis length, minor axis length. So all of these new parameters are basically just helping you separate some of the classes and to have uh, more information about each object as you perform your classification. So let's go through automation in Object Analyst. What does that look like? So um, as I mentioned, the uh, kind of step number one is to train a model and establish a template, normally using the GUI, although some of it can be done using Python as well, and we'll, we'll get into that later. But here we have basically kind of scenario number one, where a user might want to map the same area of interest with the same data set over time to measure something that's changing, such as urbanization. So here we have a Landsat 5 image from 2009. We perform the segmentation and classification on that image. And then what we can do is we can go back in the archives and pull data sets from, uh, from, from older uh, time periods. So 1984, 1990, 2001. And you can see here that uh, those different data sets have been pulled and, and processed. And then we can perform the same classification. So you can see that that model that was established on the left is actually what's being used to automatically classify everything on the right. So you wouldn't need to manually delineate training sites or anything like that for the other data sets on the right over Calgary. And that's a particular example that we've presented previously, but it's meant to show uh, how the urban versus non-urban landscape has changed over time. And there has been significant uh, increase in urbanization in Calgary over the last 30 years. Um, this is the same principle, but what we've done in this webinar is we've actually applied it to building footprints. And so what Jason's going to be showing is this demonstration. So on the left, basically you have uh, Kingston and Ottawa. So we've, we have kind of two different areas. I'll just kind of toggle back and forth. You can see underneath there's uh, two different locations. So what Jason has done is he's collected training sites over two different geographical areas. The data sets are the same, um, but the location has changed. And what the, what the reason we do that is to basically uh, give the, the model more data so that it can uh, basically train. Um, then what we can do is we can uh, replicate that over uh, other geographies. So we have Gananoque, we have Kingston, and we have Ottawa. So you can see that we did the classification of those three areas using um, the automation capability based on the model that uh, was trained over, uh, over Kingston and Ottawa. So we don't need to process the whole data set. We just need to collect, segment, and uh, provide the uh, machine learning algorithm enough samples that represent what's going to be contained in our data set. So that, that's what Jason's going to be showing. This is a quick um, summary of the actual workflow. So you can see here um, we have the, the template, we have uh, uh, the GUI, either the in GUI or, or in Python. We could do the segmentation, the attribute calculation. Then we go through a process of, tr of establishing training sites or labeling the polygons and determining what they are. 
And then from there, we can basically classify that. And once we've classified that, you can see this arrow that goes down here. What it'll create is a hyperplane model or a, a, a support vector machine trained model that stores the fit between the training sites that we've provided and the resulting classification for those polygons based on the classes that we've created. So once we have that training model, we can start over here on the left without any manual interaction. We can provide image two, image three, up to image n. There's really no limit. And then we can go through the process of repeating the steps. So uh, doing the segmentation, doing the attribute calculation, using the trained model that we've generated through our manual process or the Python-based process, and then export that or export out the results or the classified results. So, um, so this is the end GUI. I'll just quickly run through. Uh, Jason's going to be showing you this, and we've got great uh, uh, content showing you how this works. And we, we think it's quite intuitive, but it's uh, it's worth reviewing really quickly here. Uh, but basically, what we have is a canvas inside Focus. So when you pull up the Object Analyst tool, there is a batch classification operation at the bottom of the list, and uh, what that does is it pulls up the folder where your raw images are located that you have not processed. Uh, it asks you for your model. So uh, down here, you have to specify what model was used to fit the training sites to the resulting classification. And then you can basically uh, specify where you want your output images to be located. So you set these three parameters. And uh, here are some of the uh, specific steps that were run previous to that. So we can experiment with the segmentation we can experiment with the attribute calculation and the resulting classification so these this, this is just basically keeping a record of your various experiments and once you're sort of satisfied with your experiments what you can then do is when we pull this up and and we uh, we populate all these parameters you can see that the segmentation the attribute calculation and the svm classification items for the batch classification are red which basically tells you that you need to tell the batch classifier which uh, segmentation you'd like to repeat, which attribute calculation you'd like to repeat, and which classification you'd like to repeat. So you go through this process of dragging the segmentation that you think is the best one, the attribute calculation, and the segmentation and the classification. Sorry. So and and once you're done that, then you basically right click on the batch classification and you hit run. So that, that's basically how it works. It's pretty intuitive, um, but uh, that, that's just a quick summary of it. So that's about it for me for now. I'm going to launch another poll really quickly before I pass over to Jason. So the second poll is, what are your main pain points? So um, what, are you, what are you currently experiencing in terms of doing feature extraction? So uh, are you having trouble with uh, pre-processing the data, maybe generating orthos or using orthos that um, you you know you, you can't trust, you don't know how they were processed, so you, you'd want to have control over the ortho or the DM extraction. Uh, maybe you have the lack of skills to, to leverage object-based image analysis. You just you just don't have the skills yourself, or you don't have the staff. Uh, maybe you don't have the uh, enough automation. It's very manual. Uh, maybe it's large data sets that's kind of slowing you down. You you know you've tried object-based, but you just find it uh, it it's kind of slow. Um, and it's hard to repeat the same results. And uh, if there's something else that's uh, that you find uh, to be challenged, by by all means, let us know. So I'm going to leave that open for uh, just a few more seconds. And I'm going to close it down in three, two, one. Thanks very much. And uh, sharing that out, kind of interesting. So uh, lack of automation, large data sets, followed by pre-processing. And uh, once again, I see that the questions panel is kind of lighting up. So that, look, that looks like you're letting us know what that other uh, might be. And we're, we're always uh, uh, glad to get that feedback and to hear from, from you. So at this point, I'm going to pass over to Jason, who is going to walk you through the demonstration. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Kevin, for the introduction. And good morning, everyone, from Ottawa, Canada. Um, 
as Kevin mentioned, uh, we're going to I'm going to showcase the object analyst workflow uh, utilizing ADS imagery for object-based feature extraction of building footprints. So now, as Kevin has discussed, we're going to utilize a template training model for our batch processing. Now, it is important that we create this training model um, that will be then used for repeatable classification. So that is our goal. So with that. I have open uh, two ADS strips. So these two ADS images were collected or acquired, and then their initial area of tri triangulation was improved with, through tie points. A uh, digital surface model was then extracted, uh, filtered into a digital terrain model, uh, orthorectified, mosaic to be used for this process. In addition, I utilized the digital surface model and the digital terrain model to filter them into a normalized height model, which will then set the ground elevation at zero, which will just make our processing uh, far more easier for interpretation. So what we can see I've identified two areas. I'm going to zoom into our uh, top right. We can see it's Ottawa. Um, so now to create this uh, training model, I identified a number of areas of interest that represent a diverse uh, range of land covers. So Ottawa, for instance, contains an array of building types from high rises to industrial to residential. Uh, while I also identified another area of Kingston, which I can zoom to, uh, which contains more rural, uh, urban, uh, agricultural areas as well. Um, so identifying those, uh, we can then showcase the classification of these areas, which will then develop the training model. We don't need to process the entire uh, ADS strip. We could just identify areas of interest that contain the land classes we require and clip them out for our processing. So we can go through the uh, object-based or OA uh, workflow from segmentation, attribute calculation, training model collection, um, for each of the different areas. So here's an example of the Ottawa. So I clipped the area of interest, but what we can see is I didn't use the entire image. Instead, I created additional areas of interest that represent the different kinds of land classes in this area uh, of the ADS mosaic. What we can see, I'm gonna turn off the segmentation first, is I've covered the downtown core, so where our parliament is and some of the high rise buildings. I covered the southern area where there's more residential, and I also made sure water was covered. Uh, and then the bottom left is where our uh, experimental farms are uh, in, uh, in Ottawa. So identifying those areas, we were then able to run the, seg the process uh, constrained in those three areas. So running through the uh, process, I ran the segmentation uh, utilizing the RGB and IR and height. Uh, attribute calculation, uh, because we had RGB and NIR, what I was able to do is I was able to select the source channel, choose the band aliases, have the segment the segmented vector, and I could right click on the vegetation indices because the ADS imagery didn't contain the uh, inherent metadata, I could then identify and choose the associated uh, band channels. So we have blue, close to blue, green, red and NIR. By doing this and selecting OK, we then are uh, allow or we are uh, we can now select from a multitude of different indices to help with our uh, attribute calculation and our overall classification. And so I did this for both areas uh, for Kingston and for the Ottawa. Uh, and before I ran the classification, I actually uh, selected and exported all the training sites collected from both data sets and then merge them together using VEC merge. From that, what we can see here as an example, and I'm minimize that, was the two different areas combined. So I'll zoom into our Kingston, for instance, and we can see my different training classes. Here I have the buildings, the impermeable ground features, so roads and pavement and concrete, um, permeable ground, so grasses and soils, trees, and lastly, water. I made sure that the attributes and the training sites collected from both data sets are the same, have the same name conventions. 
um, as this will be very important uh, for the merging and for the accuracy of our model. <laughs> so now I, I clip the areas. Uh, we could see in this Kingston and the Ottawa, I merge them together, and then I ran my classification. This classification then produced a training model, which then I can use for the entire image, for all the images uh, in my project. So the Kingston, the Ottawa, and the um, Gananoque. Uh, so once I collected the training sites, created the classification model, we can then see the results. So here, for example, is our Kingston data set. Just going to zoom to it. And I've extracted all the building footprints. Now, before, I didn't use all the, the entire area. I only did a number of different areas of interest. <laughs> However, automatically, the system might segments of the entire image, collected the attributes based on the training model. And I was able to choose this by having the uh, batch classification uh, in the processing canvas. So we've documented the segmentation, the attribute calculation, the classification. With the batch classification, as Kevin mentioned, I put I set the input location as the uh, folder that contained all of our images and now put location and the training model, the hyperplane model. I then added it into the batch classification and then dragged and drop, or you can actually right click and select add to, to the batch classification and then right click and run. So here we see the results of the Kingston area. Uh, every, all this, the entire image has been segmented and classified. So we have building, the impermeable ground, which we'll just load in just a second, the water, the all the different features. So this worked for the Kingston. We have our Ottawa data set as well. <laughs> and here we see the height model actually over a, a zoomed in downtown core. But we see there was some uh, blunders around the uh, high-rise buildings, which actually caused a bit of misclassification. So by opening up the dissolved segments, the classified dissolved segments, we can see all the high-rise building footprints have been classified. There has been some misclassification. However, this can be easily rectified by using uh, our rule-based classification for each of the images. But now the most important thing is the third data set because that we collected no training sites. We never processed it uh, manually. We instead used the training model derived from the other two data sets for classification. So let's take a look and see what happened. So here, the Ganaokwe, we can see automatically the building footprints have been classified. We can zoom in as well. well let's go to a one to one resolution. We can see again there's been some misclassification. Uh, however, the Overall building footprints have been identified. We have the option to also look at the impermeable ground surfaces and the permeable and the water and the trees. So not only are you extracting uh, the building footprints, you're also identifying and extracting many other types of data features which can be useful for whatever uh, processing or analysis you require. So the important thing is that you cover, you collect training sites that cover an array of land, cover, land classes um, is that will ensure you have an accurate model uh, training model which will then provide you accurate classification results. So now I just want to quickly talk a little bit about the metrics. So processing um, this data set, uh, I have a brief table that documents the different amounts of time each process took. So for the processing, uh, the data preparation, so identifying the land covers for the application, clipping the large uh, mosaic um, from its RGBI, the raster data, merging it, it took around 15 minutes for each mosaic because you were just clipping everything. The segmentation for each of the areas of interest was around 11 minutes for each one, and I did it twice, so 22 minutes. And these are the parameters I used. Uh, because I want to utilize, uh, I'm working with high-res imagery and I'm trying to get building footprints, and of course buildings can be very varying sizes, I set my scale to be around 30. Of course, you could set the scale uh, between 0 and 500. And of course, the larger the scale, the larger the segments you're going to acquire. Uh, 
but I wanted to keep a, the scale at a low value. And for shape, because I really wanted to identify the, uh, the shapes of the buildings, I wasn't too focused in the spectral information, just more of the shape. I put shape to be 0.7. And lastly, I, I left compactness at that, the default 0.5. As mentioned, I, I then collected the attributes um, from the merged data set. So the RGBN, the height, I then collected some statistics, the statistics for mean, the elongation, uh, NTVI, and the texture mean. And that took 15 minutes, again, for each of the uh, areas of interest that were classified. Then I uh, collected the training sites. And this, this could be 30 minutes. It could be more. It could be less. It depends on how... Uh, robust you want to ensure your training model is. Uh, you, that just requires you to go in, identify different areas, and lastly, merging, classifying, and then batch processing. Uh, so overall, looking at the time, the total processing time of the training model generation took around four hours and 45 minutes over a total area of 24.26 kilometers squared. Um, the batch processing, which was uh, done through the automation, through the batch processing GUI, took around 60 minutes uh, for those three areas I showed. Also, what we could identify is a, is a rate. So what we could see is it takes around, the segmentation takes 0.404 uh, uh, minutes for kilometer, per kilometer squared. Um, so, or, yes. Uh, so what we can do is then extrapolate that for a total size uh, ADS strip, and so the example of the Ottawa was 415 kilometers squared. So then we can take an estimate of processing through the batch classification. Once we've extracted our training model, it will take around two hours and 48 minutes to do the entire strip. And of course, the important thing is that the training model generation took quite a, quite a while, but once that's ready and once that's done, all you need to do uh, is process your ADS strips because you have now a repeatable uh, process and methodology. <laughs> so for accuracy, uh, we just did a brief overview of uh, compar comparisons. I extracted, downloaded uh, building footprints from the city of Kingston, um, and we compared just the total area in kilometers squared between our data set over a little neighborhood and theirs. Of course, their buildings have changed between their building footprints and ours, but we identified a, a difference of around 0.1 kilometers squared. Um, and this is an example of our, the manual footprints that were extracted from the city of Kingston compared to ours. Oh, one second. My apologies. Ah, yes. So yeah. one more thing about that um, project is that before I worked at PCI Geomatics, I actually did a project with the city of Toronto. And what we identified was that it took 1.5 minutes per parcel of um, a little residential building or neighborhood uh, to process and extract the features, while manually uh, extracting the building footprint took around 10 minutes per parcel. So we could see that there's around a, a 10 times amount of speed up between automation and um, manual processing. Great, thanks, Jason. I think I'm going to grab uh, control again here so I can show a couple of things. Perfect. So I'm just going to catch up to where you were. Sorry about that. Oops, here we go. Yeah, so quickly want to uh, run through uh, how this is all possible through Python. Unfortunately, we don't have a live demo for you, but we do have some scripts and a lot of great documentation on how to use our Python API. I uh, strongly suggest that if you're interested in that, uh, you reach out to Jason. He'd be happy to provide you with some of the scripts that he's been uh, writing. And uh, we also plan to post some of these resources on our support landing site. So. Uh, later on, we'll give you the links to all those places, but we have a dedicated uh, support website at support.pcigmatics.com where you can find tutorials and sample scripts to automate some different workflows using our software. Um, so basically within Python, we can definitely do the segmentation, the attribute calculation, and the training site collection. Uh, that can be done in the focus GUI. And then um, 
the Python can then be leveraged with the GUI to train, uh, to collect the training sites. Um, so typically that would be the process is to uh, get the image template done in focus. And then from there, uh, you can basically access all of these algorithms. So these are the names of the algorithms. OASEG, which is for optical imagery, uh, obviously relates to segmentation. Then we have OASEG SAR for radar imagery. Um, then we have some specific algorithms that we had to write basically to make the Python workflow possible. So OA field name export basically is what that's short for. Um, and that basically takes the attribute fields from the columns and dumps it out to a text file, which can then be used by the other algorithms. OA calc at, so that's just calculate the attributes. The calculation of attributes for SAR is a little bit different, so it has its own algorithm. Then we have the SVM train. So you can provide basically uh, and derive the training model using SVM train based on the training sites. And then the classification algorithm itself is called OASVM class. So these are all the different functions that could be uh, basically put together uh, through Python scripting. Um, in terms of uh, doing any of this processing, whether it's within the Focus GUI or in Python, or if you're working on multiple images and you're trying to achieve the same results, the, the, these are some tips and tricks that we want to make sure you uh, that we pass along. So the resolution of all the images should be the same. So if we're extracting a particular feature, um, the success of that extraction algorithm will be very much dependent on the consistency of those features and the size that they are in the raster data set. So in this case, we used ADS imagery at 20 centimeters um, consistently throughout the whole workflow. Um, the channel, so the raster channels should be mapped exactly the same way. So because we're training, uh, when, we're, when we're extracting uh, attributes and we're performing the classification, we expect the data to be organized the same way. So in our case, we had red, green, blue, and then near infrared in channel four. And then we can either calculate the, uh, or in, in this case, we also had the normalized height model or the height map uh, stored as a channel in the data set as well. And it was always in the same channel in the various data sets. Um, the third point, I think Jason has mentioned this as well, but to, Pro, to do a proper job that represents your entire area, you really should take care and collect uh, training sites over the different types of land that you're going to encounter across your data set. So uh, that was the approach that we took. We were fundamentally trying to extract buildings. And what we did is we chose kind of like a mixed area in, in Gananoque and Kingston and Ottawa. And we provided the algorithm with enough of a uh, uh, training site uh, bank or a collection of training sites so that the algorithm, the support vector machine could actually do a good job to process all the different data sets. Uh, now the advantage of this type of approach as opposed, as opposed to a deep learning approach, which is maybe some people might be asking, well, how come the, the, the buildings don't look perfectly square and how come um, you know, you don't have millions and millions of training polygons and all this kind of stuff. Uh, that's because we're, we're doing a machine learning algorithm and it's based on the data itself. So we're not modeling or uh, uh, predicting where the buildings are going to be using a deep learning algorithm that has, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of uh, training data sets, which is typically what's needed for that type of application. We are working on developing that type of technology, but that's not what we showcase today. We showcase the uh, image-based machine learning algorithm. So just a couple of summary notes. So um, we have obviously the automation batch processing that we highlighted today. There's a number of new attributes which are going to help you. This is, uh, essential, we think, uh, new and updated technology that allows you to do much larger, more complex projects. So you could do large spatial extents, you could do deep temporal stacks, um, you could build robust, automated, repeatable classification applications. And we really think that using the Python API underneath, you could actually scale up and process really, really big data sets. Um, so 
PCI's Object Analyst is easy to use. It supports multiple platforms. We didn't really get into it because we just focused on this one particular type of data, but I, I did notice there were questions about other data types. So we do, of course, support satellite imagery, aerial imagery, UAV imagery, radar imagery, uh, and so on. So we have quite a lot of support and not just to bring it into Object Analyst, but to properly orthorectify, to extract elevation if there's stereo, uh, to derive interesting um, um, uh, interesting measurements. For example, with radar, we can leverage compact pole imagery or, or quad pole imagery to derive things like um, pol polarimetric decomposition parameters that can be useful to separate classes. So there's just a really, really rich set of algorithms available in Geomatica. Um, we have the machine learning algorithm and the segmentation technology, which is quite easy to use. It's been modularized within Python, and uh, it really sort of blends seamlessly into the Geomatica environment. So if you're already using Geomatica, or if you're using another tool, and then you're going to an object-based image analysis software package, you could actually streamline that whole process and uh, move over to Geomatica. There, there could be some benefits there in terms of your productivity. Um, some examples of use, so we've, we've done large scale areas over large spatial extents. Um, we, you, you could use it for many different applications, crop, vegetation monitoring, urban sprawl. Um, so we, we really think this is a great tool. We hope that you get a chance to try it. I'm gonna summarize here a couple more things, uh, have a one more poll and then open up for questions. So we have our support. Websites, if you just go to support.pcigmatics.com, you don't need to type all this other stuff here. You can just go, you can just type support.pcigmatics.com and you can get uh, our help. Um, you can uh, get in touch with uh, our support team, but also other Geomatica users. So we have a community forum. Uh, you can see up here at the top of the support page. Uh, we do have some people who are asking questions and uh, other Geomatica users who have experience with your application might be able to help you, uh, but we also monitor that ourselves. We have our, our YouTube channels, um, with our YouTube channel mainly, which is quite good. And um, looks like Jason did provide a link here for a sample script for object analyst batch classification. So uh, we will provide you uh, this presentation and all of the links are gonna be working in that presentation, so by all means. Yeah, so this is what our community forum looks like. So you can see this is just a screenshot of the community forum and there's, there's different topics. Um, and uh, so you can, you can kind of dig into a specific topic or post a question and uh, just try to get help. This is a look at our YouTube channel. Um, you can see that uh, we have specific um, short YouTube videos or full webinars available. So this is one that we did with NA, NAIP or NAEP imagery over uh, the US. Um, this is one, this is actually one that focused on city of Hamilton. And uh, so anyway, there's a lot of resources available as it relates to object analyst. Um, we have a specific batch classification um, tutorial here that's uh, listed on our website. And uh, we also have our cookbook. So if you're if you're more interested in doing um, Python scripting, then uh, you can sort of get up to speed on Geomatica quite easily using our, our various resources for that. So I'm going to do one more poll just before we get to the questions. We did get a, a few questions coming in. I want to get to those, uh, but I just want to do one more poll. Uh, one of the things that uh, we are really really keen to let you know about is the fact that we have uh, people like Jason who are uh, willing and able and we allocate resources to this uh, to help you evaluate our technology so we're just asking a simple question would you be uh, interested in uh, getting help from someone like Jason so you, you can send us data um, you can identify a specific uh, challenge that you're having and we can try to help you with that. The whole idea is to speed up your evaluation of our technology. So someone who's technically inclined will take a look at your data set, uh, run through a workflow, 
produce uh, some materials that you can then use to evaluate whether the technology uh, fits with uh, your requirements. Um, so we do we do have a a great uh, uh, a great staff a uh, number of staff who are similar to Jason. We call you know technical solution specialists basically who can help you out. So I'm going to close that down in three seconds. Thanks for all of you who are voting on that or help giving us your answers. I'm going to close that down. Um, and I'm going to go to questions, I guess. Well, just summarizing again, there's some more webinars coming up. Um, we already mentioned this, but uh, you can hit our website to get the, the description of the webinars and uh, register for the ones that you're interested in. So we're, we're pretty good on time. We're 10 minutes before the hour, and uh, we managed to get through quite a bit of content. I hope you found it interesting. I'm going to pop open the questions panel and uh, see if uh, there's anything. So if you have more questions right now, would be the great time to ask. Um, I'll just run through a couple of them. So one question we had was uh, about accuracy assessment. So we didn't really focus on that, but the question was, when comparing different classifiers, is it possible to see the statistical significance between the results of the classifiers? Um, again, we didn't really get into that today, but when we collect the training sites, what we can do is we can either allocate uh, the polygon to be a training site polygon or to be a uh, accuracy assessment polygon. And in so doing, we can then run the confusion matrix and perform accuracy assessment. So you could run experiments uh, and measure your accuracy quite easily within the object analyst. Uh, framework. So that was a great question. We had a question about uh, can we use all satellite images? Um, so that, that was a good question. We are not quite sure what all satellite images mean, but uh, suffice it to say that PCI has a long legacy of processing uh, satellite imagery since the company was created, which goes back to 1982 with Landsat, that was one of the first satellites that we added support for. And of course we support uh, quite a number of satellites. Um, we have a question about uh, a segment appeared as a single part. So basically what this question is about is uh, whether um, individual buildings can be uh, segmented as opposed to maybe multiple polygons within the building. Um, so I, I think the question there relates to, you know, getting a single polygon that delineates the exact extent of the roof, for example, or the building. Uh, um, and, and that's certainly possible. And I, I would say that the main way that that would be achieved is by controlling the um, segmentation parameters. So things like the scale, uh, the compactness and um, the uh, I'm drawing a blank now. Jason, help me out. You can unmute yourself. Um, Say it again. <laughs> there, there's different parameters: shape, scale, shape, and compactness. There you go. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we had a question about uh, which type of data set is ideal for building footprint extraction. So. Uh, that's interesting. We don't have tons of experience using it. So the question is, is it optical or radar? Um, we don't have tons of experience doing building footprint extraction with radar. Um, I would say that uh, using radar imagery is going to be very challenging because of uh, the artifacts that are contained in radar data. Um, but I do know that this is a topic of research right now. I did attend some conferences lately uh, and I noticed that uh, radar is being used to do urbanization uh, analysis, uh, and it's quite promising. So uh, maybe we can follow up with some links to some papers that we've seen recently at uh, conferences. Um, so we have another question about: Is there any? Are there any particular? Um, so we, we got a couple of questions. I'll address them both. So one question is about: Is it possible to use UltraCam? So uh, digital frame camera on an UltraCam system. So absolutely, it is possible. We've presented webinars previously using 
older ultra cam data over the city of Hamilton. Some of those are on our on our YouTube channel. You can definitely go back and check those out. Um, and then the other similar or uh, a similar question, I guess, relates to: Are there any particular requirements for UAV images? So, so what what we will say about our methodology and what we've presented is: We think that you will be successful if you're able to process the data set and extract um, a DSM, so a digital surface model from the stereo overlap in the data. And obviously, the better the stereo overlap, the better the DSM. We have advanced algorithms to produce one-to-one -one DSMs from the imagery. And that really is going to drive the accuracy of your uh, building model extraction. So either you use the stereo in the data to extract the DSMs to then generate the surface uh, height model, uh, or you can use an external source. So you could use a LiDAR point cloud and interpolate that to a gridded surface in our software, and then filter that to a DTM and then generate the height map and then as, as, as attach that to uh, imagery. Now there might be shifts in the, in the collection dates. So, um, in a perfect situation, you have high resolution imagery together with LiDAR, like on the same day or the same week, so there's no changes on the ground. Uh, but we, what we found is LiDAR and aerial imagery tend to be collected in, at different times, whether it's fall or spring or across different years. So there are some operational issues to take into account there. Uh, we have a question about whether we support uh, point clouds, so absolutely we do. We are able to read point clouds into our system. Um, I would say that uh, for us, point cloud is more of a way to generate a 2D gridded surface. And uh, basically what we can do is we can take the point cloud, we can merge it with break lines, we can merge it with other elevation sources like point heights, all, this, all these different types of elevation data, and we can create a digital surface model uh, based on that um, and, and use it in this analysis. Uh, another question about export formats. Um, so in the context of object analysts, what we showed is basically um, delineating polygons and then uh, each polygon has at, at the very, very least, the most simple case, it has the class name. So polygon number one, class name building. So it would basically be uh, a shape file. Uh, that would be the easiest thing that we could generate. Um, and then from there, you know, um, you could generate GeoJSON, you could generate um, other types of data types as well. So I, if, that, if the question was specifically related to the polygons that we create, I would say the simplest thing to do is to export to shape file from our system. Um, but, uh, if it's raster, then it's a longer answer, a different answer. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, Jason, if you want to pipe in and answer any of the questions as well, I want to give you a chance. To, is there anything else that you want to mention or? Uh, um, <coughs> sorry. Hmm. I'm just taking a look as well. Um, you cover most of the questions. <coughs> sorry. Um, about the UAV, uh, about or aerial. Actually, have you mentioned um, there are? There's a question about particular requirements for UAV images, and just wanted to let you know that there will be a UAV webinar um, in the following weeks uh, that will be covering the whole process from end to end workflow, and we'll be even showcasing some uh, feature extraction uh, from that in an application. Perfect. Yeah, great point. We will exactly be doing feature extraction as part of that. So um, we'll be covering the nuances of how to use UAV data, how to process it uh, so that you can get good, uh, good features extracted. So with that, uh, we'd like to thank you once again for making the time to uh, learn more about PCI technology. We hope that you download the software, uh, contact either myself or Jason. Um, we're, we're basically just last name at PCIgeomatics.com. And uh, we will be providing a recorded version of this webinar as well as the slides. Uh, thank you so much for making the time. Appreciate it very much. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, everyone, for attending.